Good afternoon, and welcome to day five of Energy Finance 2021 online. I'm Sandy Buchanan, Executive Director of the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, coming to you from Cleveland, Ohio. Today's session is entitled Petrochemicals, Overcapacity and Community Opposition Challenge the Industry's Growth Projections. <clears throat> Before we get started, let me explain how our question and answer session will work. You'll see on the right-hand side of your screen, a chat box. Feel free to place your questions in the chat and the moderator will relay those to our speakers. You can also use that chat box to interact with other conference attendees. And now I'm pleased to introduce Suzanne Matei, who will moderate today's session. Suzanne is an IEFA energy policy analyst based in New York City. She is an attorney with 30 years of public interest law experience and the former regional director of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Now, let me turn this over to Suzanne to introduce our speakers. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're gonna have an exciting program today. We have two speakers who are going to join us. Sharon Levine is an internationally respected environmental justice advocate who has been campaigning against pollution in Louisiana for many years, especially in the area known as Cancer Alley along the Mississippi River. She's currently fighting to stop construction of a large petrochemical plant, the Formosa plant, and that's been a major battle for her. She is a co-founder of a faith-based community organization known as Rise St. James. I've always loved the name of that organization. She has testified to Congress. She has used the court system bringing legal actions and she just received the esteemed international Goldman Environmental Prize. So we're very happy to have her with us. I'm also going to introduce Tom Sanzillo. He is IEFA's Director of Financial Analysis. He's got 30 years of experience in public and private finance. He served as a first deputy controller of the state of New York. He has overseen a $156 billion pension fund and also 200 billion in a municipal bond program. He's the author of several studies on the fossil fuel and petrochemical industry, looking at issues from the financial and investment perspective. He's got special expertise in investment strategies, corporate governance, and also government budgets and finance. So we're going to start first with Sharon Levine's presentation. Thank you. <music> I'm Sharon Levine from St. James, Louisiana, and I am the director and founder of a faith-based grassroots organization called Rise St. James. In the past year, we have done so much. The fight is still going on with Formosa to try to keep them from building. I'm talking about Formosa plastic. They are not backing down, and so are we. We are not backing down either. Because if Formosa come here, we will not live. They're going to have 14 units inside the complex. And Formosa would be a death sentence because it's going to be so huge and the emissions are going to be so great. And they're not going to follow the guidelines. The pollution will kill us. Trust me, it will. We have so many things that we don't see anymore. We don't see a butterfly anymore. We don't see frogs anymore. We can't plant a garden anymore. Our trees are dying. You know, if our trees, and our fruit trees, pecan trees are dying. You know, we are, we are dying too. And it's, it's no doubt that it's, not, it's the industry. We can give you a whole list of people right in this area who have died from cancer. There's so many people now that's living with cancer and being treated for cancer and other ailments. We are fighting for our lives. We're not fighting just to be fighting, to be ugly, that, that we don't want the plant to come in here. We have done so much even though it was the pandemic. We have meetings weekly, every Monday. It's called Stop Formosa. It's a group of us that get together to, so we can strategize on what to do. And we get together, write letters, 
and do actions, do banners, do all kinds of things. In the past year, the Army Corps of Engineers had to uh, go back to the board to reevaluate their permit because the judge said that they violated some of the laws. And our attorneys filed a lawsuit against the Army Corps for the Clean Air Act and one with the Clean Water Act. So all that's put a halt to Formosa from being built. So Formosa is at a standstill. They can't construct right now, which is good news. The people in 5th District and some of them throughout the parish of St. James, they are, they are behind Rise St. James. They want us to continue to fight. They commend us for what we're doing. The politicians shouldn't use our community to bring revenues to the state. There was an industry that tried to come in in the third district and they hurried and voted it down because it's a predominantly white district. So whenever they say it's going to come in the fourth or the fifth district, they vote for it because it's poor black communities. So look how many we have already in the fourth and fifth and we have none in the other districts. If you want it that bad, put it in your district. We had our first Juneteenth on Formosa's site. That was very successful. We had it where the grave sites are. And the Bishop of Baton Rouge did the ceremony. That was nice. We found out about the grave sites 17 months after Formosa found out about the grave sites. They wouldn't alert our parish council members. So Rise St. James did. We did it on December 23rd, 2019. I remember that day because I presented to them. I went to the meeting and I spoke and I told them about the grave site. And I told them that Formosa have been deceiving them. They haven't been truthful to them about what's going on. So these grave sites, we feel like that's our ancestors. We've, we've been living here all of our lives. And the Winchester grave site is called Buena Vista. We have people in St. James with that last name, and they really feel to believe that they have relatives there. That's for most of sight. That's their property. So if we want to go on there, we have to ask for permission to go on their property to the grave sites. When we first found out about the graves, I would go back there often to go and bring reporters, friends, to go see where the grave site is until they stopped me from going. They threatened me with arrest, so I can't go anymore. Oh, it's sacred. It's oh, when that first time we did the Juneteenth event, oh, I could feel the presence of the ancestors. I could feel their presence, like like they were around us, and I felt like they were smiling. They were on holy grounds. That's their burial place, and they felt like we had forgotten about them. So when we brought it to the attention and we we sang. And we praised them. And it was wonderful. And they were there. Juneteenth is wonderful. It's a, it's a celebration of our enslaved people. The aftermath of what happened way back during slavery. And it's, it's like, to me, it's like a celebration to, to, to commemorate the memories of our ancestors and how hard they worked for this land. They lived off the land. They worked on the land and they died on the land and they buried on that land. So our fight is to continue. We're going to continue going to court if that's what it takes. We're going, to, we're going to continue doing town hall meetings. We're going to continue trying to reach the president of, of, of the United States because he mentioned Council Alley in one of his speeches. And he also mentioned St. Saint, Saint James Parish. So we want him to come to St. James Parish. So we're going to continue to try to get him to come here. We started this in 2018, in October of 2018. So this year will be three years in October. So it's something that is new and it just went viral. When we first went, whenever we did our first march in November of 2018, that's when it just took off the ground. Not knowing what, what we were doing. All, all we knew was we didn't want for most of to come in here and it went viral. It's a whole lot that I had to learn. That's a whole lot that I'm still learning. And I didn't know people trying to protect their parish and their livelihood 
was called an environmental activist. I didn't know that. And I didn't know it taken years to fight a $9.4 billion industry from coming into our backyards to save our community. Because if this industry come here, it's going to wipe us out. So I didn't know. All I knew was teaching school. And I enjoyed teaching school. And I enjoyed working with the children. I had to stop teaching. I wasn't ready to stop. But I had to because I couldn't do two jobs. You can almost, almost say three jobs. Because for mo fighting for most is like two and three jobs all by itself. I learned that people have the power. That's what I learned. We get together in groves. People are going to listen to you, not just to one person. You got to have a team, a group of people. More industry will try to come in here. So we have to keep our eyes open. We have to stay alert to what's going on. The thing that frustrates me is when people tell me you can't stop that plant. It's a done deal. You're wasting your time. That frustrates me. Now I got over the point, the point to where I don't listen to that anymore. It doesn't bother me anymore. But at first it did. Now it don't bother me anymore because I know we're going to stop the plant. What I'm going to deal with today is one of those areas that's new to us, which is plastics and petrochemicals. And I, and I want to um, um, talk, start talking a, a bit about our lessons. And those lessons um, um, will help me then sort of t frame where we're going and where the industry is going in terms of uh, the, the uh, going forward. Um, wh what we've learned is, is a couple of things. First of all, that the structure of the industry is not one industry. It's many industries. Um, Coca-Cola makes soda, but it sells plastics. And plastics, they've gotten from Dow Chemical. And Dow Chemical has gotten the feedstock for that plastics from, let's say, Shell, uh, oil company, oil and gas company. So you have many industries that are involved in this process. Um, we've also learned that there is a structure of corporations that, that govern the industry. Um, there are big oil majors like Exxon and Total and Chevron. And then there are state-owned enterprises like Saudi Arabia and Russia. Anyone with a, an oil and gas interest um, also has a petrochemical and plastics interest. And then there are pure play companies, uh, petrochemical companies that just make and sell um, chemicals um, and uh, out of uh, petroleum products and, and other products as well. Um, the Im importance of that structure sort of becomes evident as we begin to think about how we're going about our, our work. Um, the other thing to really recognize about the industry is that it's global. There is an interconnection. What goes on in Texas is important. What goes on in China is important. And they're connected. What goes on in Canada and what goes on in Taiwan, they're connected. And um, they're important to keep in mind. They're also important to keep in mind because the um, many countries that are struggling economically are using the uh, plastics and petrochemical industry as a tool for economic growth and economic development. And once many of the leaders of those countries get a sense of it, they aggressively adopt the um, policies that would be necessary to bring them in. That's a very important lesson um, that we've learned uh, thus far. The other lesson that we've learned is in transparency. This industry is not transparent. Um, and uh, at some point, they, be, they are being increasingly watched from the outside and demands are being made on them, not only from the public um, and groups like ours, um, but by um, the, uh, the business community uh, also. And the lack of uh, transparency is going to cost them in the end, and they should probably get out in front of it, but many of them won't. So, for instance, Sasol, which is a South African petrochemical company, was involved in a construction project in Louisiana. And that construction project ran into construction cost problems and management problems, and they were not forthcoming um, to their shareholders 
once the truth came out, they were sued and now are in a, um, a very lengthy and expensive um, class action suit. That's a cost um, to uh, of the industry to their culture of secrecy. Um, but where we're looking at it, um, there is very little discussion on single use plastics and very little disclosure and in, in, uh, uh, on carbon. And those areas are very important to us. And, uh, and there's, there's very little, but we've come up with some ways. And many of the people who are listening to me now have also come up with ways to pierce through the, uh, the uh, obtuse way in which they uh, report information. And we're making progress. Um, the last sort of, part of the uh, uh, the lessons that we've learned are really the looking at their short-term financial risks. Those short-term financial risks allow us to then look at the picture as it's going forward in a, in a clearer way. Um, going into the pandemic, the industry was facing a, a period of oversupply, which came from the fact that many countries over the last decade were finding reason and finding markets to build more uh, cracker facilities, more plastics processing plants, and the infrastructure that comes with it. Um, that resulted in an oversupply, prices dropped, profits dropped, and it was having a disruptive effect. The pandemic comes in and freezes part of the industry, the auto and construction industry, and in some ways loosens up the uh, medical plastics and the food packaging, and they did relatively well. Their picture coming out of the, um, out of the pandemic was sort of a mixed financial picture, uh, wasn't all devastation. They also showed an awful lot of innovation in the process. Um, coming out of the, uh, of the, of the pandemic, um, we're seeing um, the, uh, a certain a type of growth. And the growth is in the wake of the pandemic and then the storms and, and outages in, in Texas and the Gulf Coast, rapidly rising prices, rapidly uh, increasing demand. Um, and, and with that, a disruption in the financial markets. There are some short-term profits to be gained by this spike um, but it's going to come back down as the economy recovers and more um, um, facilities are built. In fact, I would say that the spike is probably going to encourage a few uh, projects going forward that might not have gone, wanted to go forward before. This is the context in which we find ourselves in looking at the longer term picture. Um, and that one of the more important factors that are driving the industry is the environment and climate. Um, the bans on single-use plastics that we've seen adopted in many places are having an effect on demand and that effect is um, negative for the industry but at the same time it's not a factor that is going to drive the industry um, into a dangerous situation because there is a lot of there's a lot of demand as i said for medical and other single-use plastics. So there's a push and a pull, a contradiction there uh, that's going on. We're also seeing governments be, uh, express concern and adopt content laws that are for low carbon uh, plastics. And similarly, companies beginning to adopt the same kind of thing. These carbon initiatives are very important and they are having an effect. Um, at the same time, they're having a positive effect, I hope, on emissions you're also seeing that they're having an effect on improving the plastics industry's um, social license to work and to build and to produce more plastics. Again, a contradiction and a tension that's driving a lot of the uh, work in the industry right now and some of our own work. The second area is in the, is in the, is the spirit of innovation that is really um, grabbed uh, hold of the industry and grabbed hold of the the, um, the tra energy transition as a whole. Um, none of us would have thought that wind and solar was going to make such advances in such a short time um, and, to, and to show such improvement in the efficiencies of their operations. But they have, and in fact, looking even at the last decade of improvement um, and innovation in those sectors don't e doesn't even tell us what's gonna happen going forward and we see a lot of positive things there. It's that same dynamic um, that we're gonna see in the plastics and petrochemical area going forward. And there we're gonna see um, um, more investments in the biofuels, which have some potential for success and has demonstrated some success. Um, 
the carbon capture and sequestration programs that are uh, a lot of talk right now. Um, uh, when uh, AIFA has a fairly good history of looking at coal uh, carbon capture and sequestration projects, we didn't find them to be very successful or commercially viable. On the other hand, there are now new projects, new products. This is a new phase, um, and we're not sure what the outcome is, um, but we're watching uh, to see if there is uh, progress uh, being made towards commercial viability. It's the same thing for hydrogen that you've heard about in the transport and energy sector. Those wider applications will also be true in the plastics and petrochemical field. And we're going to be having to pay attention to those transformations that may come of it. Um, we're also seeing um, very important um, um, trading um, issues um, emerging. Trade is really driven by the price of uh, oil and gas and then by the price of plastics and it a couple of cents change in the price of oil or the price of gas is going to move um, products uh, the product and trade flow in one way or another and alter it um, um, and sometimes in very uh, profound ways um, the pricing though is only one part of the trade picture the other part is, is that trade is political and the political dynamics are um, uh, uh, significant and often they spell the difference between a, uh, uh, making and breaking a company and a project. Formosa out of Taiwan um, is working now in a controversial project in Louisiana. Um, they had moved a number of years ago from Taiwan to China because they were looking for a government that would accept uh, looser environmental rules. And they went to China and they and they invested and they were doing all right. And then China runs into a problem with the U.S. in a trade dispute that drags uh, Taiwan into it um, and eviscerates some of the financial benefits that they had hoped by moving to China. The next phase of the project, uh, the next phase of the evolution of the company is they look into the United States for in venues that will have weaker environmental um, enforcement and they found it in Texas and Louisiana and so there are now uh, projects being unleashed there. That's how politics and trade and the market dynamics sort of intersect and color how projects get made. The third factor is the um, relative um, health of the oil and gas industry. For those of you who know um, our work, you know that the oil and gas sector is in a long-term decline. Um, they are important to the petrochemical and and uh, plastic sector and because there was going to going to be a decline in demand of gasoline for example the oil and gas sector will be more reliant on the petrochemical sector so what we're going to see is real movement by the oil and gas industry to attract and keep the plastics and petrochemical sector that's a pull by the industry towards the um towards the plastics uh, industry. The push away from it is that the oil and gas industry is going to have to charge more um, in order to um, put together a new sector that is really uh, aligned towards chemicals and not towards oil and gas. Um, that dynamic, that push and pull, again, is a very important dynamic in driving a lot of discussions. It'll drive things going forward. Um, and then the, the most important area that, that that affects is profit margins. The profit margins are um, uh, driven uh, by the price of oil and gas for a cracker or for a, uh, a plastics plant. And how they interact um, tells you whether or not the industry is going to be viable or not. That's a very big and important other factor that's driving the industry. My, my final thought is, a, is one that I think um, um, takes us, I think, uh, to where our work is. I've been trying to show you cross currents for every factor um, that's involved here. There are pressures that are going back and forth. And those factors are the industry knows. They know change is coming, the plastics and petrochemical industry. They know change is coming, and some of them are adapting to it, um, and most of them are adapting to it, I should say. Um, but how they go about that and how they handle that will be a test for them. And the same factors that are going to be a test for them will be a test for us. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the presentations. We're now going to start some question and answers. And we had some interesting questions already come through the chat um, system here. And you can still put more questions in if you would like to do that. So uh, Sharon, we've got one question from Rebecca Dell, who Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, from Matt Ewing. And he is asking, how are elected officials responding to this issue? And um, have they, have they, has anyone been helpful to you? Well, in St. James Parish, we have seven districts. I live in the fifth district. When, when they voted for this industry for most of plastics to come in here, they had five council members present that night. All five of them voted for Formosa Plastics to be built in the fifth district. They, one of our council members that's in the fifth district, he is trying now to try to rescind that decision. Uh -huh. He's the only one. And we tried to get the fourth district councilman to, to, to second the motion if Clyde would bring it up in a meeting, he outright told me no. So he would not second it. So we don't ha have anyone that would second the motion if Clyde bring it up and he don't get a second, it's dead. So the parish council, he's for Formosa because he said it's gonna bring more revenues to the parish because we have one industry that closed down, Shell. So, they want this industry to come in here, but they don't think about the lives that would be lost if this industry come in here. So they are not helping rise St. James at all. We are doing all the works by ourselves. I see. We, we don't have any other public officials in St. James that's trying to help us, no. And you've got several, so pending, you've got issues before the state uh, the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality, and you've also got uh, permit action pending before the Army Corps of Engineers. So you've got your work cut out for you. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Also a good point to, to be made that whoever said to you that there was going to be, you know, revenues, um, they should spell out exactly what they mean by that because there is a rather significant tax exemption that's already been granted by the state um, of the local property taxes of 150 million a year that's a lot of money that's not going to be paid so i don't know what they what the representative meant when he said that there were going to be more revenues for the parish i'm not so sure that's true but well, our parish president said if a most of don't come in we'll have more cuts to the public school teachers so he wanted to come He's pushing far, far to come. I'd like him to prove that. That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Tom, we received a question from Paul Gao, who is a reporter with the uh, Pittsburgh Business Journal. He's done a lot of writing on these kinds of issues. And he's asking about the Shell petrochemical plant in Western Pennsylvania what kind of um, market scenario are they going to be look at, looking at when they finally um, begin operations, which may be in a year or so? Yeah. Yeah, I got maybe the end of this year, maybe the beginning of next year. Um, um, right now, the um, uh, market prices um, for the uh, products that Shell is going to be putting out are quite high. Um, coming out of the pandemic, um, there's been uh, there's been sort of pent up demand, and there's been some problems on the Gulf Coast um, from the winter outages. So there are a number of factories that are still not out. So the, the prices are very high. Um, we expect them to drop back down and to start coming down near the end of the year. And I'm not sure what happens when that um, plant opens up. Uh, Sassol is now going to be running in its first year. A um, couple of, uh, Formosa has another plant in Texas going to be opening up. This is going to be the kind of um, warning that we were making before the pandemic that there will be an oversupply. There was an oversupply when we were going into the pandemic. And so it's a, I'm not sure, I think it'd be a highly competitive environment for them. 
I'm not sure they're going to be able to meet the original scenario, which was totally domestic sales, incidentally. I think they're going to have to develop an ex and a, 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 a foreign in, uh, sales as well. So it's going to be different from what they've said thus far. And I think the market's going to be pretty tight. Um, okay. Now, I want to let attendees know that um, Aitha did do a report on the economics of the Formosa plant, and that is accessible in the files tab next to the polls tab in your chat. And um, there, if you go on the Aitha website, you'll also see a report that was done on the Shell plant. Do you, for the Formosa plant, do you have additional comments you want to make about the finances of that, Tom? Well, I think that fine, since we've written the report, a few things have, yeah. um, that have come up. On the, on the side uh, for the company of moving forward with it, those price increases have made it look at least superficially better off. Um, and so they may want, they may see that. On the other hand, we you know, are of the view that there's going to be a turnaround and it'll be a sharp turnaround. On the other side, going in the other direction, we're seeing um, the price of construction going up which is not good for the um, for the um, uh, for for Moses, um, plans to move forward. Um, I think you're going to see greater competition um, than they've seen than they were anticipating. Not only competition because of the oversupply, but now there is more um, reuse recycling, the kind of bans that are going forward that I know people are having in mind. So we're all beginning to have some kind of traction and an effect on the market. So I think conditions, well, I think the pricing might look a little better right now. I think overall the conditions have deteriorated. And I think that's why the bond uh, uh, Standard & Poor's downgraded them uh, and warned them about moving forward with this plan. I think they're seeing the same kind of thing. And there's a related question in the chat from Rebecca Dell asking whether or not bans on single-use plastics actually have an impact on the market. Well, I'll tell you, um, the, um, I've not seen a lot of uh, uh, evidence on uh, whether or not it has, except the industry's evidence saying that they believe this is having a significant impact. Where we do know, um, we have to look at, I think this is a very important question because the broader, the broader question for us in the movement, those of us who are involved, um, is that will rates um, help us get to our goal? Will content restrictions, will plastic bans, will you know, new programmatic initiatives help us get there? Um, on that, we have a broader set of evidence um, in Europe, um, which is uh, ahead of us in many of the environmental and climate issues, um, policy-wise. Um, they have um, some content laws, and we put up a, a piece on the web, on our uh, website uh, uh, a while ago on CMD, which is this company that controls a lot of us, mark a part of the plastics bags market, and there's a mandate for uh, con um, uh, biodegradable content uh, and they've met their mandate in Europe and they found that they have a stronger product, a thinner product, a cheaper product and they were actually espousing the benefits of the mandate and because they wouldn't have done it without it and now they're looking to move the same kind of product into the United States without the mandate but with sort of a green label and they've been profitable. And so I think, I think as the, you set up a new rule in these markets, because I think the, uh, get, the plastics industry is a different kind of industry than oil and gas and coal. I think you're going to see that this, these people can respond, uh, but we have to be forceful enough to get the politicians to listen and to get the companies to listen um, to do this right. Um, but I believe that they're, they are in a better financial position to uh, make the kind of investments we want to see uh, take place. Okay. All right. Now, um, Sharon, there's a question from Lois Drumheller about uh, whether uh, from RRT Protect about the question of whether or not there's any constitutional provision in Louisiana giving people environmental rights. And I know that Louisiana's, Louisiana's constitution does establish 
a public trust doctrine saying that, that um, the natural resources of the state uh, essentially belong to everyone, that the, that the state of Louisiana holds these resources in trust for the benefit of the public. And there's been, there's a debate going on right now in one of your legal actions at the state level about that. And, and uh, wasn't there a decision from a judge that talked about the importance of considering environmental justice? Yes, there was. there was. There was. We were. We were. Um, we filed a complaint mm -hmm. with the um, with with the for the Clean Air Act, and the mm -hmm. judge' name is Judge Trudy White, right. and she ruled that this was environmental injustice, and she asked the EPA to go back to the to the to the drawing board, and sit down and re-evaluate the data that they went by to make their decision, mm -hmm. come to find out they went back to old data in 2014. So she ordered them to go back to more recent data. And she gave them 90, 90 days to go back and get that done and bring, bring it back. So in about August, we probably will go back to court. Right, because then there was a, there was an appellate decision that said that that um, the ruling was premature, that they needed there needed to be more briefing on this. And so it's sort of back, back in the loop again. But the important thing is that the issue is coming up and that people are recognizing that this is an environmental justice issue, yes. which I, I think is very important. Um, let's see, uh, Allison Robert Shaw of the Bold Foundation was asking, where we think things are going to be happening, where will the major battles be happening in the United States and also a global north, global south when it comes to petrochemicals? And that's kind of a broad brush question, but Tom, do you think you can take a crack well, at a it? A couple of things. Um, at the, yeah. at the um, of course, at the local level is gonna be the kind of organizing uh, that Sharon's doing, I think, in yes. the, not only in the communities where they're trying to expand the, um, the cracker facilities and processing plants and what have you, but also in um, communities where they're thinking of L about LNG terminals. So you know, you'll see there'll be that kind of organizing uh, going on. But you're, but that they all, all of those fights uh, are uh, are part of also the policy considerations that are that are going on, and those are going on at the local, state, and federal level. At the local level. Those folks who are organizing around um, plastic uh, bag bans and content restrictions and the like are, ve are, are very important right now. Um, the industry knows it has to make changes. Um, I'll go into that a little while if you want. Um, they, they know they have to make changes and our voice is being pushed now um, is absolutely essential at that level. So major pressure on the corporations that are involved uh, is very timely, uh, no matter how we do it, if we do it in a, in a fight like Sharon's doing or through legislative processes, um, there, now is the time um, to do this in the next, uh, in the next uh, couple of years. Um, and then what we're gonna see on the building, the building out, I think what, um, what Formosa is and then what PTTGC is in the Ohio Valley, um, are this sort of, that's the last number of crackers that were part of a wave. Many of them got built in the US, um, but these are questionable now because the markets are oversupplied and the world markets are also oversupplied. But what's, what the market is looking at is they're seeing tightening. Um, uh, 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 they're gonna see some, they believe they're gonna see some tightening even with the, um, the um, oversupply now. So out in the latter part of this decade, you're going to start to see new proposals coming forward. And what we do now and what we learn from now is going to be applied almost immediately when you start to see two or three years from now, new proposals, because they take four and five and six years to happen. And you're gonna see them in the Gulf Coast. You're gonna see more in the Ohio Valley um, uh, moving forward. And you're gonna see more pressure on the coastal uh, the terminal, uh, it's that sort of in the, 
in the U.S. And there are similar. Yeah, and uh, Reverend Robin Blakeman from Energy Efficient West Virginia. Oh, I think we lost Suzanne for a minute. I think that that was a, a question that was being raised about whether or not there would be um, a continued um, um, uh, a move in the Ohio Valley. And the answer is that there will be. There'll be, uh, I think there's going to be continued pressure by PTGC for a while in the, in the southeastern part of Ohio. And that that will, um, we don't know. Um, there are pluses and minuses there. We wrote a little report on that. Um, and we're concerned about that one. Um, and then there are some other ancillary things going forward. I think the overall market is probably negative, but I think they're going to keep, um, they're going to keep trying to, um, um, to move things. And so we're at the end of one phase and the beginning of another phase. Um, I think we might've lost his hand, but there's another question um, on the, um, the tax subsidies. Um, and the question here is whether or not the uh, um, efforts to reform the fossil fuel tax sub successful, do we think there'll be any impact on the, uh, on the production of virgin plastics? Look, I, th I think that the way that our economic analysis is sort of developed, it tells us that the margins on these plants are very tight, which means that the, the level of profit is um, not what it used to be. And so any tax subsidy, like the tax, if they didn't have the tax subsidy in Formosa of 150 million would go forward. I don't think that project would go forward. So the answer is if reforms can be made and changes can be made on the tax subsidy side, they, I believe they'll have a fairly substantial impact on it. Susanna, are you back? No, maybe not. All right, we'll go yes, on. Hi, I am now back, but I, I still can't see the chat questions um, right now. Uh, but I do want to direct a quick question over to Sharon. Sharon, do you see that, um, do you see greater public awareness compared with when you started your efforts? Do you feel that more people are joining in now than were in the beginning? Yes, I feel like more people are aware now because they weren't aware of the emissions and they weren't aware of how many industries we have mm -hmm. and they ask questions now and we give them flyers to read with information on it and uh, they are aware now and they are glad that we're in this fight especially yeah. the ones in, in my neighborhood that's great no. that's great and there's another question just a second um uh, that was asking about can't we push the in industry for for uh, cleaner plants and good jobs? You know, how, my, how do we make this situation better? In my opinion, yes, industry is not going to give us cleaner jobs. Once they they are promise it to you, once mm -hmm. they get in here, they're going to pollute us like the rest of them are polluting us right now as I speak. So I don't trust that and I don't believe it. And I feel like we can have other jobs besides being being polluted. We can find green jobs that, that people can live in this community. If any if any more come in here, we will not be able to breathe the air or drink the water. We still don't drink the water. But if they were promising an EPA would, would regulate these things, I have seen jobs, I mean, times when they are not doing their jobs. I have people in the industry that come back and tell me they sit down and drink coffee with them or drink up soda water with them or something and they give them a good evaluation and they leave. That's what I was told with the people that lives that live in St. Jim that work in industry. They know because they work there. And so they are not going to be honest with us. They are going to lie. They're going to pollute us. We are in a neighborhood that they chose to put these industries in because they knew that the people in St. James were not going to speak out. And the parish council just looked for what they can get out of it. And they don't care about the lives of the people. Okay. They want whatever they can get. Understood. That was a question that had come in from Grant uh, Goodrich of Case Western Reserve University. So I think it's a, it is a very, very important question. 
Tom, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I think uh, two two things. Um, one is um, the, I I went with Sharon a hundred percent on the uh, on the arguments on on the Formosa plant. I'm not I'm not sure after reading the environmental analysis that was done and uh, and given the conditions that are there right now that that is going to be a viable plant. Sometimes the regulators just have to come to the conclusion that this is not the right place or the right time for a given plant. And hopefully the environmental regulators will, you know, conclude that um, um, you know, going forward. You know, can you get a better, jo uh, better, more environmentally sound, safer plants? You can, but the I, and and this is something that I, I'm hopefully you know, some of the folks in um, in uh, Western Pennsylvania will think about a little bit. Is um, there are promises that are made, like Sharon mentioned, about jobs, about health and safety requirements. But if there is no follow-up, if there is no community oversight pushing it, this is going to get built. We lost. Shell's going to get built, and uh, and it's uh, questionable. Um, after decades of the western part of Pennsylvania trying to clean up from the metal and coal industries, they're now faced with this other uh, very risky, um, environmentally risky um, um, plant. But there needs to be continued community monitoring of it and organizing because I think Sharon's correct. Um, particularly in tough economic times, the companies are going to look to walk away from those promises unless we can um, unless we can hold them to it. And the same thing on the jobs. Um, they, if they promise the number of jobs, they should have to um, produce those numbers of jobs or or. Uh, uh, deal with some economic repercussions of not meeting their goals. Um, and I guess there was just one other point I wanted to make on the same thing about whether or not we can make sort of the system respond. Um, it actually already is responding, but not good enough in my view. Um, one of the uh, sections in our report was uh, a piece um, that the credit rating agencies, Moody's, um, put out a couple of pieces and they put out, this is a bond rating agency. It looks at corporate finance and it has written several pieces, which we identify in our report that I would suggest a lot of us read because they said that given the level of environmental injustice and given the level of economic injustice that is, that is occurring in the world. And even in places where the, um, economy is strong and there's recourse through the courts, like in the United States, many countries there are not, um, that we're losing and we're losing. And that that overall effect of um, weakening communities and weakening whole uh, groups of population through poverty and inequality is bad economic policy. It's bad for the climate. I did not expect to see that kind of a uh, a clear analysis coming out of Moody's, although they've been doing some better things on climate as well. But this is one where they're saying economic injustice and environmental justice are problematic for investment going forward. And I think it's something that the uh, industry has to be very careful about how they move forward, um, because I see the same thing occurring. And, um, and it's not we, you can't just keep abusing uh, the communities and the people and expect them to put up with it forever. And the, the repercussions are going to be, they will be losing lawsuits. They're going to be, uh, they'll be, they'll be overly restrictive legislation. No one will listen to the companies and the other companies will complain that, but they are taking advantage of the situation right now. And at some, at some point, the organizing work that's going on can have a fairly big consequence. And Moody's is quite, um, uh, it's very important that they that they are stating that at this point. Okay. Well, we're getting flooded with questions now, and it's going to be impossible to get to all of them, I think. Um, but uh, one one question is uh, how do we how do we reconcile the need for plastics? to support the clean energy economy, uh, polymers for solar panel back sheets, and wind turbine blades, et cetera. And, um, and to, to what extent do tax subsidies push, uh, enable the use of uh, virgin plastic as opposed to recycled plastic? So those questions I see kind of related. 
Um, can you talk to that just a little bit, Tom? I think that I think the um, the, the first part of that question is um, is a question that means we have a lot of work to do, um, and uh, the question is really. You know what is the where, where the uh, plastics serves a social purpose and can serve a social purpose. I mean, we saw during the pandemic the response to keeping people alive and how plastics were able to do that. But not all plastics is involved in is involved in the, doing that, and not all the uses are. And so it's going to be our job, the the uh, climate and environmental movement's job. To have the discuss to force the discussion in communities and at the state and the federal level is what is the proper use of, uh, of plastics and and what are the trade offs and how do we do it better and not to give up on our vision because we're being told it's that you know you're going to get in the way of jobs you're going to get in the way of taxes. This industry can bear the pressure um, and it can actually be made better in my view. And maybe I'm naive, um, but I'm not saying they'll let off on one bit of pressure, but I am saying, I think you, we can get a lot out of it if we keep, if we keep pushing on it. And tax subsidies are exactly right. I would, it's really a decision we make in government as to whether, you know, what you want to see subsidized, what you want to see supported. Um, and you don't want to see things that are toxic and damaging to communities um, supported and you do want to see things that are healthy but when it comes to plastics this is an ongoing discussion this is not something that's going to get settled in one bill or one law this is a big it's as big as the climate discussion if not yes. if, if not bigger which is how are we going to live together um, a, you know with an economy that functions that's that's healthier we can achieve these goals but the voices have to be raised and we have to keep at it. Now we're gonna to have to finish up pretty soon. I, I'm hoping I've got enough time to ask one more question of Sharon. And that is, when we keep talking about, about the, economy, the economy and the choices that have to be made, it does seem to me, and I think to a lot of people, that the heart of the environmental justice issue is that there are only certain communities that are being asked to do that balance and make that sacrifice. And is that is that the part of the problem here? Yes, yes, that's a part of the problem. Because in the third district on the East Bank, we, um, this industry called Wolverine tried to come into St. James Parish. Mm -hmm. The council members voted no because it was going into a predominantly white neighborhood. So they immediately voted no for that one. Then when Juan 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 wanted to come on the East Bank in the fourth district, a predominantly black district, they vote they, they didn't get a chance to vote, but they were planning to vote until Rise St. James stepped in to bring facts to them to let them know what, what this plant was about and that they would they would bring home to the community. They would bring more pollution to the community. And that's when they, I guess they listened to us because they didn't vote it in. Mm -hmm. Then when Formosa came, wanted to come, it was coming into another black district, which is the district where I live, the fifth district. And they voted for it, all of them. They voted for it to come over here. And that's making us a sacrifice. Formosa's huge. It's what, it's what, 11 chemical plants and a couple other Yes, it's a huge facility. It just boggles the mind how big that facility would be. That's right. What an impact it would have. Yes, absolutely. Yes. That's right. Okay, um, Tom, do you have any final word for us? Um, I think I think we're at, and, and as I, I I said before, but I think we're we're entering a a, a period where um, some of the the um, uh, best thinking about how we can um, move forward economically is taking place in the world. There's a lot of good work going on in the European communities. There's a lot of work going on. The EU is sponsoring. There's some in the United States, not great policy work, but the 
organizing work that's going on is very good. And, but you're seeing it everywhere. You're seeing it in South America, you're seeing it in Australia, you're seeing it all. And I think that that is, um, uh, is having uh, uh, an impact as to how the economy is going to move forward. We, we, you need to have the kinds of things that play, the kind of needs that plastics meet, you need to have it, but you also need to have the ongoing debate about which ones do we need, which ones don't, and, and can we make whatever it is that we do need in the, in the most sustainable way possible. The way the industry is set up right now, it is going to see changes. It is going to see environmental, it's going to see climate changes, it's going to um, go through a whole series of new feedstock changes that are going to come about, and there is a massive amount of economic competition going on. The they have to change, and our voice is organized and put forward in there with scientifically intelligent um, ways of thinking about things technically, sound proposals. You know, we've done that in the energy sector, in the electricity sector, by, by, by continually hammering away at the need for solar and wind, and the markets began to respond, and we're doing better than we should. We should be doing better, but there is a 10-year history now of progress with wind and solar energy, um, and we need to see that same kind of project uh, progress, and it comes from our voices. Um, and that's what has to has to take place. And I'm confident that the um, that we can um, uh, uh, meet the kind of economic goals that we want to see and environmental goals. They're not in conflict. Right. Well, I think that's correct. We had had some other questions starting to come in about uh, other alternatives to plastics, which we won't be able to get into today. But I think it's important to recognize that there are other ways to to chip away at this problem by finding alternatives that are not as harmful as as the kinds of, of uh, materials that are dominating the market right now. Uh, so I would like to thank both you, Tom and Sharon. Um, your presentations were wonderful, and the responses to the questions were very informative. And I also want to thank all of the people who have participated in this, in this presentation and providing the questions that they have. I want to remind you again that you can look at the report that was produced on Formosa um, in the, the, file, the file tab that's, that's right next to your chat tab. And you can also visit the IEFA website for more information on petrochemicals in general, on the Shell petrochemical plant. There is also a report that was done on the PTTGC proposal that was uh, that has been planned for, um, where's that? That's Ohio, right? Yes, Ohio. Right, and we still don't know what's happening with that one yet, and whether it seems to be kind of in limbo right now. So it's facing problems as the industry is that Tom has described. So I think we are about ready to uh, return to Sandy. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sharon and Tom and Suzanne, for sharing your knowledge and your insight into the way that petrochemical plants affect communities and the market situations that are uh, covering the world right now. We hope that uh, you all will stay with us for maybe about another 10 minutes to watch the next in our series of videos called Local Leadership Global Change. This video highlights the work that members of the Navajo Nation and Hopi tribe are doing to call for the comprehensive cleanup of closed coal mines and coal plants whose operations affected the quality of the water supply and the quality of life in the communities. We also hope you'll be right back with us here tomorrow for our next session, which is called Renewable Energy, Lessons on Grid Integration and Benefits for Communities. Also, of course, feel free to join any of the side meetings that you see listed in your agenda. Thanks again and goodbye.
My name is Nicole Horsherder, and I work for the organization Tornajona Ane, which is a Diné organization based on Black Mesa, which is in Northeast Arizona on the Navajo Nation. Tornajona Ane means sacred water speaks. Its mission is to protect the water source of Black Mesa. My name is Percy Deal. I'm retired, I'm 71 years old. I used to be a president at the local chapter. Then I used to be a member of the County Board of Supervisors for Navajo County. I do a lot of uh, volunteer work for the community situated on the Black Mesa area near where the Peabody Mine used to be. I'm Wahela Johns. I'm the director of the Office of Indian Energy at the Department of Energy. We provide technical assistance to 574 tribal nations and Alaska Native villages and corporations. We also provide financial assistance. For this administration, there's a huge commitment to transitioning communities like the one I come from in Black Mesa, where we once had one of the largest coal strip mines in the Southwest. My name is Ben Novamsa. I am a member of the Hopi tribe from the village of uh, Shingopavi, Second Mesa. I am a member of the Bear Clan. The Bear Clan in our culture are the traditional leaders. And that's really why I'm doing what I'm doing, because it's my duty. I am former chairman of the tribe. I have been working on the issue of reclamation of the coal mines on Black Mesa, on our aboriginal lands. The whole ecology has been impacted, and that needs to be brought back to the pre-mining condition. The federal government appears not to be concerned about Reclamation, and neither is a coal mining company, Peabody Coal. The lease was signed between Peabody, the Navajo Hopi tribe, and also Department of Interior back in 1969. Nicole's family and my family are the same clan, which is in Navajo, is Chisha. She's a Chisha and I'm a Chisha. I got my master's in linguistics in 1998 from the University of British Columbia. I went there because I wanted to study in a place where the most number of indigenous language families were represented. I originally came home and I wanted to teach at the local community college. I wanted to teach Navajo language and linguistics 101 and 102, you know, beginning syntax or something like that but i maybe maybe after i stop doing this work i can do that when i came home in 1998 you know of course one of the conversations was where are you going to build your home and where are you going to raise your children and i had already chosen a place in my clan lands then i realized that the springs nearby no longer produced water. And I asked my mom and my grandparents, you know, what happened to the water? And they said, well, this spring here stopped producing water this many years ago, and the spring over there stopped producing water X number of years ago. And I was, I was baffled by this. They didn't have a a, a clear explanation. I, of course, took my Western training, started doing some research and started asking some questions and found my answers talking to some experts and some people who worked at the USGS. They had been collecting data in the Black Mesa region since the early 70s. And I found out that the decline in the aquifers were due to the coal mining that was happening on Black Mesa. The Peabody Coal Company pumped the Navajo Aquifer, which is pristine Ice Age water. And they were pumping 3 million gallons a day, starting back in the 60s, all the way to when the tribes shut it down in 2005. Those are billions and billions of gallons of water. The Black Mesa mine transported coal to the Mojave Generating Station using a pipeline. 
and it used groundwater as its means of pushing pulverized coal to the power plant 273 miles away. When I was uh, just a little kid, I used to herd sheep. We used to have a large flock of sheep and cattle. What my parents and the neighbor used to do was they used to dig, you know, with their hands and they go no more than uh, three feet down, four feet down. And you see a lot of water coming up. And that's how they used to uh, water their animal. Right now, there's nothing. When we discovered that the mining company was using excessive amounts and wasting our groundwater, Percy Beal, one of our local leaders in the community, advised us to create an organization that would advocate for the water. You know, of course it was, how do we stop this? How do we get industry off our only source of drinking water. How do we get them to stop using it in such an irresponsible way? You know, where do we go? I remember one of the very first trips I made with my husband, Marshall Johnson, and his niece, Wahela Johns, who's now in the Department of Energy under the Biden administration. We made a trip to the Office of Surface Mining in Denver, the regulatory agency that oversees mining and enforces mining regulation on indigenous land and, you know, brought our concerns to them. And the, the man who spoke to us told us that we have a government to government relationship. If you have concerns about the coal company operating on Black Mesa, you take those concerns to the Navajo Nation. That's what he told us. And uh, yeah, thank you, Office of Surface Mining. You set us on our journey and here we are today, 20 years later. It was that journey that got me here. You know, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for water. The Navajo Aquifer taught me a lot about life, really, culturally, uh, spiritually. You come from a community like Black Mesa, where we still don't have access to power. We don't have access to running water. And yet, you know, you know, these resources, water and coal have been, you know, exported to provide power for cities like Los Angeles and Las Vegas. You know, life has been very difficult for us. There's no power, no running water, the road are in terrible condition. The well at, at the nearest chapter is 20 miles. You got to go south and get your water. That, that's where I get my water. Organizations got together and fought for the end to the pumping of the in aquifer for the Black Mesa slurry line. And so we ended that excessive, wasteful, and irresponsible use of pristine groundwater back in 2005. Kianta Mine continued to operate after that and stopped operating in August of 2019. They continued to use 1,200 acre feet of the same groundwater right up until they closed. Fighting mining companies and power plants and, and working towards closure, that's hard stuff. That's really intense stuff. It's had a toll on me and others that I work with. Whoever invited me to the first IEFA training, bless their heart. It's a connection that was meant to be. One of the very first things I asked them was, I need someone to evaluate how unprofitable and how uneconomical Navajo Generating Station is. I need to know what it's costing to run the plant. And I need to know what the cost of renewable energy is in comparison to coal. And, and they came, came back with a report. I could translate it for the Navajo speaking public. And those reports in our hand were our, our weapons, basically. Our, our weapons against continued fossil fuel. Black Mesa Mine has been closed for over 15 years, and there has been no closeout reclamation done, very little. The Peabody Coal Company has already filed for bankruptcy in 2016, 
And then now they are indicating they might file another bankruptcy. So if that happens, if the federal courts allow them to leave, then it leaves it up to the states or the local governments to find the financing to do the reclamation work. And that is one of the reasons why we are looking to the federal government to appropriate funds to repair the damage. The, the vegetation is pretty much all gone. That used to be there for the animals, like the deer, the antelope, and they've all left simply because there's no more forage for them. And Navajo people are known for their rug weaving. They used to use certain plant to dye their wool. Now they can't find those plant anymore. And then the other thing is that the corn used to grow maybe about five, six feet high. Uh, a couple of years ago, I tried planting and it, it grew no more than a foot high simply because it really lacks water. The, uh, the soil is now different. The squash isn't there. The potato isn't there. And all these other uh, vegetables that you used to plant, it just simply isn't there. Diné people live within the lease area. They have to be involved today to plan for what their community is going to look like when these lands are returned to them. When and if the Office of Surface Mining, Reclamation and Enforcement decides to do the reclamation work, they need to issue a permit to the Peabody Coal Company that is a significant permit revision. Significant permit revision then would trigger an environmental impact statement. It would trigger tribal participation in the decision-making. A lot of tribes want to go towards renewable energy, and that's not a surprise to me because it's all in line with our values, our teachings, our language. We got to create a model that is actually centered around community, centered around the environment, centered around the people. The root of Navajo belief, the root to Navajo way of life is having respect with Mother Nature. In Navajo, they say, Tua ina that what that means is uh, water is life. When we started our work, we constantly drew upon the knowledge and the wisdom of our traditional teachings of water. Anytime we lost our direction. The water always refocused us and reminded us of the true goal of our movement. That is to protect the water for the future generations. Mm -hmm.